and welcome everyone to this week's Maternity Midwifery Hour. Um, my name's Sue MacDonald, I'm the curator for the Maternity Midwifery Hour and the Maternity Midwifery Festivals and it's my pleasure to be hosting this evening's session. Um, it's week five of season 11. I always have a little bit of a, a wonder that we've come this far. I was having a chat with Loretta just before that, just before we came on to say the birth of maternity and you're going to get that wee story just as you always do um i'm delighted with your we have two speakers today one is kind of virtual and that's leah hazard and one is loretta who is in person which is fantastic so because we always do this poor loretta is going to be the only person that's put on the spot to share her moment of the week so please loretta i hope you have a delicious moment of the week to share with us. Uh, good evening, everybody, and thank you for having me on this. Um, I do. I have... Um... <laughs> can, I share, can I share now? Yes, you can. <laughs> um, my moment of the week, we opened, so I um, am the CEO and founder of, of the Menopause Hub, it's a centre of excellence for all things menopause, and we opened a third clinic in Ireland just last week. Um, and week. this week, um, and week. This um, as in just yesterday, our local, the pharmacist, that's our neighbour in our new area, sent us in cupcakes and brought in cupcakes to the team. Ooh. And to be honest, or well, you know, yeah, to brought them into the team. And to be honest with you, I was taken aback by that and I was really blown away because I thought, A, it was just a beautiful gesture. It was very welcoming to the neighbourhood. We'd only literally opened the clinic last Thursday or last Wednesday. And so I just thought that was really nice now. And, and we'll hopefully partner with them on work in the local area to help women and so on. So I just thought, you know, small things make a big difference. Well, I'm sorry, Loretta, but cakes are not a small thing. <laughs> That's wonderful. What I'm thinking is how many little cupcakes came in? Were there enough to go around? <laughs> there was more and than are there enough. any left <laughs> they, they, they would be stale by now but there were plenty to go around oh, and it was a really good. lovely lovely gesture I was really touched by it to be honest by the thoughtfulness of people you know yeah, um, yeah. and I think that's that's what is special isn't it when you have someone who's actually thought it through and come up with something very special that's a lovely moment of the week thank you so much Loretta well we're coming back to Loretta in a moment but just as I always do I'm just going to remind you where we came from. And I was having this chat with Loretta earlier because just to remind us all, we were born in the pandemic. We're one of the good things that came out of the pandemic. Um, and re it was really a way because because you remember the lockdown. Can you remember that? Those terrible days when we were not allowed to go out. We were only allowed out for exercise and shopping, little bits of shopping. And we also knew um, we couldn't provide study days or conferences or anything for midwives and student midwives. And we really wanted to make sure midwives and student midwives and anyone at Agia Maternity Services had some sort of connection and also information. You remember that time it was very difficult to get information. People were very stressed. We didn't have much time. So we decided an hour a week we'd have maternity service focused we'd have something for midwives and student midwives something on some things on covid some things on what the services were doing and really develop that into what it is today so thank you for coming today if it's your first time i hope you're going to enjoy this this evening i'm sure you will do share if you've got a, a, a you'll get a, a, a kind of um, now we call it the box set it'll come probably sometime tomorrow sometime Friday maybe and we also have a podcast on Friday and it'll come to you and if you want to share it with your colleagues please do because it's a great way of discussing and I think the topic we're looking at today is going to be a really useful topic for you to share with colleagues and really explore what your service are doing for women and, and work within the workforce for women who are going through the perimenopause and the menopause to make sure they're they're looked after and supported and so they can contribute and be valued as they should be this is also a fantastic resource for those who are studying you're doing validation very useful for that 
Um, it's all free to access. If you want to have more targeted um, study resources, you can subscribe for a small monthly fee and you could just join for a couple of months. You might get hooked and want more. Uh, and that's where getting the box sets, which also have reflective activities and additional resources that our lovely Dr. Jenny Hall does for us. Um, and that's fantastic because you and you will get hooked. You will get hooked if you go into that. So I'll say a big thank you to all of you who are working so hard to provide care to mothers, babies and families and the students as well. I know it's a busy time for them. We've also got new students in the system. So welcome to any of those of you who are new to midwifery. It's lovely to have new people here to, to share stuff with. Um, and also, I'm going to say, look after yourselves because it's a busy service. And we are used to juggling all of the things we juggle at all times. Just remember yourself and your own mental health and well-being and your general health. Remember, not too much chocolate. I'll say that. Being a bit of a chocolate, chocolate addict myself. OK, I've just got a little bit of news. The biggest news, of course, is, is all the things that are going on in, in Israel and Gaza. You just... It's just horrendous to think of what's happening. And I just I'm praying for peace for both sides to be at peace and for healing for both sides. I was really encouraged. There's a, a group called Jewish and Arab Women Calling for Peace. It's called Women Wage Peace. And they've they really they've been talking on Twitter about the need for peace, the need to just think, the need to think about others and just not just go out for revenge or hatred. We really need that in this world today. So good on them and, and have a look at that if you're a tweeter like me or an ex or whatever they call it these days. Okay, it's still Black History and Culture Month. We're still on the theme of celebrating our sisters. And I noticed actually on kind of on celebrating one of our sisters is Olan Mas Ogbuhi's article on baby loss in the UK and she was looking at the Embrace report and that's on the Maternity and Midwifery Forum newsletter so if you don't get that you can subscribe you just need to go further on that page that you're on now and, and put yourself down for that good thing also very nice article by our Loretta here which includes a 10 point plan for menopause friendly workplace now I printed it all out because I thought it was really good you know the really Sim simple it seems simple like formulating a menopause policy like making sure there's training in place like involving male employees but i know loretta's going to talk about that so that i'm just saying there's a this really good article you can access and guess what today is menopause awareness day and therefore of course we're looking at the menopause today and we're looking at our kind of title is midwifing through pre pen perimenopause a challenge, exodus, and opportunity. And we know that it's it's only really in the recent couple of years that people have been focusing a little bit more on the menopause. Um, it's been a bit of a stigma, stigma, a bit of, you know, you see people laughing about it, you know, the hot sweats and the brain fog and all the things that women have to put up with, and they're not very funny if you're experiencing them. Um, but it's important to be aware, of course, that it's something like 77% of our workforce are women within the health service. And we need to think about this as the effects it has on us. Now we have um, virtually Leah, Leah Hazard. Now I'm going to, we're going to start with Leah, Leah's session. Now Leah wanted to be with us, but couldn't, but we twisted her arm. No, we didn't really. She twisted our arms and, and did a, a little recording um, so you can listen to her words, which will be very good. Now, she is born and raised in America. She moved to Scotland in 1999. She has a really interesting personal history because she's worked in directing programs and worked as a BBC researcher. But when she had her baby in 2003, she kind of changed her career direction. She first went and trained as a doula, but then moved and became a midwife and has worked in all areas of midwifery within Scotland mainly. Um, and she's now started writing. And, and some of you will have read her hard pushed book, which is 
quite hard hitting. Got moments of humour. Excellent book if you haven't read it about the life of a midwife. And she's also just published something called Womb, and um, which is snippet. It's really interesting. Also different. She's got a wonderful writing style. So that's on your resource. That's a that's a cue for me to remember to tell you about your resources that you can access online as usual. So we're going to cue now, Leah, and Leah's session. So I hope you're going to enjoy that now. So cue, Leah. Hello, hello, everyone. Thanks, Thanks so, much so much for having, having me. me. Uh, Thanks, Thanks Sue, Sue for inviting me on this evening. evening. Although I'm actually, actually not, not doing, doing a new live this evening. evening. I'm, I'm sorry about, about that. Um, I, I was looking, looking forward to a live, live conversation and then something else, another engagement got in the way, which couldn't be rearranged. So I'm pre-recording this. Um, for me, it's actually Tuesday morning, hence um, coffee and my lovely pregnant lady mug. Um, certainly wouldn't be drinking that in the evening. And uh, I'm just going to have a bit of a chat about some of the issues that I would have been discussing live anyway. So um, when this conversation airs, it is going to be Wednesday the 18th, which is apparently World Menopause Day. And I have to start by saying that I find that um, holiday or commemoration a little bit ironic because um, although I'm sure the menopausal transition for some people is is something to celebrate and is um you know doesn't cause them any problems for me it's uh it's i feel a bit like waving a black flag um it doesn't feel like uh something that i'm particularly keen to celebrate but um it is certainly important to raise awareness of issues around perimenopause and menopause and obviously for this evening's conversation i'm doing that specifically in the context of midwifery now i recently uh, wrote an article for um, Sue and Jenny about uh, midwifing in perimenopause and menopause. And this really came off the back of the recent NHS England workforce report, which, um, I mean, it's, it's no huge surprise. I don't have the exact numbers in front of me at the moment, but it kind of echoes every other workforce report that we've seen for the last few years, which is, you know, mass exodus of midwives. Um, and particularly in, in this most recent report, um, and, and also echoed by RCM figures, a lot of the people who are leaving the register um, are saying that they're doing so either earlier or much earlier than they had planned to do so. Which um, kind of makes you wonder, you know, why is that the case? And we know that a lot of um, I hesitate to use the word older because old is a relative term, but we know that, let's say, a lot more senior staff um, have been leaving over the last few years as well and wanted to kind of unpick why that was the case. And as I wrote to Sue um, after I saw the report, you know, I suspected that one of the main reasons why some of the staff in the, let's say, 45 and older year, uh, age group um, might be leaving, uh, one of those reasons might be, you know, issues to do with um trying to work through perimenopause and menopause which can be a really difficult and challenging time not for all women but for some women and people who menstruate so just to give a little bit of background about um well first of all what what do we mean by perimenopause and menopause and then also um you know how does this affect people in the workforce a lot of you who are watching will probably already know this maybe you're going through this life stage yourselves already um but the menopause the clinical definition is when it's been one year since your last menstrual period. So menopause is really something that can only be diagnosed in retrospect. But a lot of us use the term menopause as a kind of catch all phrase to refer to, you know, that entire time from the end of your periods to, you know, the rest of your your life. And perimenopause is the stage leading up to that final menstrual period, which can be um you know, for for some people, absolutely fine, but for others, a time of um, numerous hormonal kind of transitional symptoms, um, and these symptoms can occur anywhere from a few months up to maybe five to ten years prior to the actual last menstrual period. And again, not everybody finds this a troubling time, um, but some of the symptoms that people can experience in perimenopause are um, much heavier uh, menstrual periods, more painful periods, mood disturbances such as anxiety, panic, depression, low mood, <clears throat> 
cognitive disturbances such as brain fog, forgetfulness, difficulty sleeping, um, achy joints, kind of random aches and pains, musculoskeletal difficulties, tinnitus, palpitations, dry skin, um, genital urinary syndrome of the menopause, which can be um, vaginal dryness and general sort of vaginal and vulval atrophy. Um, I mean, you name it, the list goes on and on and on. I think the, the actual official list is somewhere around 50 symptoms. But you can imagine if you even have just a handful of those symptoms, it can be really um, scary, isolating debilitating and difficult to deal with in the workplace, especially when you have a job as challenging as midwifery is in, you know, in this day and age. So for a bit of um, kind of statistical uh, background in terms of how many women and people um, might be affected by perimenopause and menopause in the workplace and particularly in midwifery, um, I actually had a look online at my local health board's um, menopause policy this morning and 41.7% of the employees in my health board are um, women over 45. Wow, <laughs> I mean, that surprised even me. Um, I mean, when, when we think of a health board, we think, okay, predominantly, um, you know, there's a huge nursing workforce, administrative workforce, managerial, and you think, okay, yes, maybe female dominated. But even I didn't expect the number to be as high as that for this particular female age group. Um, I looked at some information from the recent parliamentary hearing about uh, menopause in the workplace. And in 2019, the Chartered Institute for Personnel and Development reported that three in five menopausal women were affected negatively at work by their symptoms. Um, a BUPA survey identified that almost 900,000 women had left work because of symptoms in the perimenopause and menopause. Um, and uh, a survey by the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists identified that um, they said one third of women were unable to go to work at any particular time because of their symptoms. And 31 percent um, took time off, by which I think they mean, you know, more than just a week and an extended period of time. So that's a lot. So this is not just something that, you know, is the odd hot flush or, you know, is affecting people on a really kind of intermittent level. And it's something obviously that's a major consideration for workforce planning and employers as well. Um, and when we look at, um, you know, menopause policies in the workplace, so NHS menopause policies are fairly fairly new beasts, fairly recent creations, um, I think that have kind of arisen out of this increasing awareness of issues around perimenopause and menopause. And uh, they're all fairly similar across the board and they focus very much on, um, initially it looks like the kind of policy that you would see for any other kind of um, illness or disability, if I can use those words. So the manager is encouraged to sit down with the employee and talk about what their symptoms are and make, um, you know, the, the famous term reasonable adjustments for the problems that the person might be experiencing. Um, and those reasonable adjustments in these policies are often cited as um, wearing a cooler shirt or um, having access to drinking water being able to go to the toilet and um, having a quiet space to sit down and work and being able to take regular breaks. Now, um, are you laughing already? Because I am, <laughs> because when I read these particular um, suggestions, uh, you know, as, as a midwife who's worked very much in the acute side of midwifery for over 10 years now, a, a lot of these suggestions are admirable, but completely unrealistic. And, uh, for for the way midwifery exists now anyway. Um, and I'll come back to that in a minute. I'll kind of circle back to that. But maybe what might be helpful, first of all, is to share kind of how my own symptoms affected me over the past year and how I had to basically take an extended period of time off work because for me, midwifery just absolutely wasn't compatible with the way I was feeling. Um, and I wrote about this in my my piece and I should preface it by saying, um, you know, people sometimes say to me like, oh, it's great that you're so open about kind of challenges in midwifery and you talk so freely about this stuff. And 
I really want to preface this by saying that it's actually not easy for me to kind of discuss, you know, challenges that I've faced, um, particularly when they're very personal ones like this. Uh, I don't enjoy talking about kind of darker points in my career or, you know, times when I felt isolated or ashamed. But the reason why um, I feel strongly about speaking about these times and specifically about perimenopause and menopause is because um on the one hand you think oh it's everywhere in the media but there is still a bit of stigma and taboo in talking about these things and for me when I was going through that really dark time last year and kind of trying to figure out what was happening to me um, it really was only the voices of other women that got me through that time but yes I did have some medical treatment eventually and did have um, some excellent therapy and support from family but I have to say that the you know a really fundamental piece of that puzzle for me um especially in the beginning when I really had no idea what was happening was um other women on um internet forums you know chat chat rooms message boards whatever you want to call them saying you know I'm going through this do you have this oh yeah I had this this is how I solved that um and those really sort of granular quite intimate questions that aren't in the public discourse so I'm sharing my story um in the way of kind of paying it forward and hoping that maybe this will help somebody who's who's watching or listening this evening. So for me, um, so I'm 46, I just turned 46 um, about a month ago. So you think, oh yeah, you know, perimenopausal, obviously, you know, things are gonna happen. And I had been ha having sort of mild kind of signals of perimenopause over the last five years. So much heavier, more painful periods. Um, maybe the odd ache and pain, maybe a little bit of sort of mood, kind of labile mood um, at certain times of the month, but nothing really, not, nothing at all that was really debilitating that I couldn't handle in my day-to-day -day life. And then um, last July, I got COVID um, at work <laughs> from an unmasked, very unwell patient. And really within, um, and I was quite unwell with COVID and, and fortunately recovered from that. But really within a few weeks of my COVID infection, I began having what I now know in hindsight were um, very sudden and severe perimenopause symptoms. And we we could have a whole other conversation. This was part of what was so confusing for me. I th thought, you know, do I have long COVID? Like what's going on? Am I just not coping? Um, what I realized afterwards that for many women, COVID actually does affect receptors on the ovaries and many women experience kind of sudden and severe perimenopause and menopausal symptoms after COVID infection. Anyway, how and ever. And um, what happened to me was I did go back to work about, I don't know, maybe a month after I had COVID. Um, and my mood was incredibly flat. And again, I thought, well, maybe it's just, you know, I've had a bit of a hard time, had a bit of a rough year, even before COVID. Um, just no motivation. I remember just walking into work thinking, just completely numb about being there. Um, had, you know, classically really, really busy shifts. And there was one particular shift where it was quite busy, um, lots and lots of women in and out all day long. And it was about half past five and, and two quite complex women came into the department at once. And I just had a extreme sort of dip of like sudden exhaustion. Uh, fatigue doesn't even really begin to describe it. I now in hindsight know that I have these dips <laughs> you know, from time to time, especially at certain times of the month now, but um, just, just powered down, massive dip in energy. And because I felt completely suddenly exhausted, I think I began to panic, but it, it wasn't like normal anxiety. I felt like um, I took my own blood pressure, which was through the roof. My head felt like it was going to explode. I was having chest pains. Um, I was cold and clammy and sweaty. And I just thought I can't, I have to leave, which is something that I hate doing at work. And it's very embarrassing and feels shameful for no good reason. Um, so I left, I went home and I think I was just in a state of complete shock for the rest of the day. I didn't understand what had happened, why I was feeling so anxious. These physical symptoms were very confusing. Um, and I did go back to, I kind of forced myself back to work um, a couple of days after that, but I, I actually can't even remember that shift. I think I was still in a state of complete trauma and I just felt as if my body had completely betrayed me. Um, 
So I decided to take a little bit more time off work by which I, I thought at the time I meant maybe a week or so, but it turned into four months because what happened was um, I just lost myself completely. Um, my mood would go from sort of just kind of constant anxiety to complete debilitating depression for no good reason. I have a lovely life. I know on paper, I'm very lucky. I have nice things. I have a nice family. I've got lots of love and support around me. Um, exciting things were happening for me, you know, professionally with my book and so on. But um, I could barely get out of bed in the morning. I couldn't function. Even the thought of, you know, crossing the kitchen to make myself a cup of coffee would terrify me. Um, driving my kids to a, you know a class in the evening or something would leave me in tears and I thought am I just losing my mind <laughs> like I would sit down to try and write you know I've written books I would say well, I'm going to sit down and write and I couldn't actually concentrate for more than 15 minutes um, I just could just couldn't put anything on the page um I lost my appetite. I wasn't enjoying anything. I couldn't sleep. Everything was just terror. And I think I thought I just wasn't coping with life. Um, and, you know, I think as women, we tend to kind of turn it on ourselves. But at the same time, I think there was a kind of a small intuitive voice in my head saying like this, this really isn't you. Um because there was there really was no reason for me to feel that way and I knew that and it felt as if something else was in my head so long story short um I did after a few kind of abortive attempts and sort of runarounds with the GP and so on managed to try HRT um which at first really disagreed with me and then I started again on a much lower dose and then when I did that within days I actually began to feel an improvement and then after a few weeks I kind of had myself back a little bit um and couldn't couldn't believe how different I felt um and then I did go back to work in January of this year um and I was okay I was managing but I just realized this pace is not for me anymore um you know I, I felt a lot better in myself with my mood and things that HRT had started to make a really huge difference but I realized you know, I, I can't work like a robot for 12 hours without a break anymore. My body just won't do it. You know, I, I do still have times where I feel tired. Um, I do still have horrible periods where I, you know, need to go and change my clothes or sit on the toilet for five minutes or something or take painkillers. Um, I do still have moments of, you know, I just need to take a, a minute out. And um, I do also, you know, have the odd hot flush and difficulty sleeping and so on. And I just thought, you know, this midwifery in the way that I've been practicing it or the way that I've had to practice it is not compatible with this stage of my life. Um, and I deserve some ease and I deserve, a, you know, to be able to work without killing myself um, or, you know, or feeling like the job is killing me is, is what I mean, really. So, um where am I going? So I guess my point really with this is that, you know, when I when I returned to work in January, um, I noticed that some other colleagues who are sort of similar age to me were wearing like nice cool polo tops instead of our usual kind of heavyweight tunic. Um, and they were like, oh, yeah, these are these are the menopause shirts. Like you're allowed to wear this if you're menopausal because it's it's cooler fabric. And so that's that's it sorted like that's us catered to. Then we're all OK, then, aren't we? And I, I just remember looking around thinking, wow, like this is really this is really the NHS's solution to accommodating people in perimenopause and menopause. It's like here, have this shirt, you know, much in the same way we've been told in the past, like, well, have this badge. Oh, well done. There's a sticker. There's a cup of tea. There's a wee pizza for you. OK, there's your wee menopause shirt. And I thought, no, nah, this is <laughs> this is just not on. Um, so for me personally, my solution was I've actually, after much deliberation, left where I used to work and I'm doing bank shifts in a much less dramatic, kind of easier um, environment, um, doing some outpatient clinics. It's not really my passion, but the days are shorter, much less stressful. I get my break. Su suits me and my body fine just now. 
But is that really, you know, are are we really doing the best for people like me in this season of life who who are having troublesome symptoms? You know, is it right that I've had to basically leave my job or my old job, such as it was, I was working in that department for seven, eight years and completely changed my working habits and my, you know, my clinical area because I'm just going through a normal life stage. And also, you know, for 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 everybody who's going through perimenopause and menopause, is it right that our answer is just here, have a cooler t-shirt or, well, there you go. There's your access to cold water. There's your access to the toilet. Um, you know, in theory, yes, you have a break, which you'll never be able to take. I don't think it's good enough. Um, I know that recently the government <laughs> had a debate around whether menopause should be a protected characteristic and, you know, our, our rights to these accommodations should be enshrined in law. And it was decided that it should not be protected characteristic. So maybe this is as far as things are going to go. But I really feel like if we could, the adjustments that people in perimenopause and menopause need are adjustments that would make life better for everyone in midwifery. You know, like, I'm not, just because I'm perimenopausal, um, doesn't mean I'm the only person that struggles to work 12 hours without a break, right? Like that's not really reasonable. Um, the stressors that are affecting all of us are, are, are also perhaps disproportionately affecting people who have troublesome perimenopausal and, and menopausal symptoms um, or, or, you know, or anybody who has a physical condition that requires a, a wee bit of leeway, you know, a wee bit of ease. We're not asking for a lot. If we could remove or at least decrease some of these stressors such as relentless workload you know 12 hour shifts mandatory 12 hour shifts with with um few or no breaks taken difficulty getting to the toilet difficulty finding time to get a glass of water um absolutely no access to a quiet place to sit down and catch up on your notes or you know no no facility to say look I just need 20 minutes to go and like sort myself out before I can take the next patient Th these are actually like normal human needs I would argue actually maybe basic human needs and um, so my argument in the piece that I wrote and that I guess I'm really reiterating today is that if we can you know <laughs> reduce some of these completely unreasonable and and overwhelming stressors across the board in midwifery it actually makes life better for for everyone. It's not like people in this stage of life are asking for the moon. You know, it's not like we're asking for, you know, well, I actually need the whole afternoon off or I'm only going to take half the patients that you take. We're just asking to work like humans. You know, there's a lot of talk now about humanized birth and humanized midwifery care. And, you know, we want to provide that for the people in our care, but also we deserve to be able to work like humans. Um, For me, the past year has, has kind of taught me that in a sort of harsh way of that to learn it you know it really in a, a tough and undesirable way but I think that's a lesson that all of us you know midwives and, and and managers and senior managers can learn as well is that you know we we just want to be treated like humans at work we need a little bit of accommodation you know we would like a manageable workload we would maybe like to be able to go to the toilet or to take that break or you know yeah to go and sit in a cool place for five minutes or to catch up on our notes in a quiet room we we would like to not have to see 40 women in one day um and i think if we can really do better at enshrining these reasonable adjustments for people in perimenopause and menopause and um, then perhaps we can think about extending those adjustments to midwives across the board, you know, and healthcare workers across the board. Obviously, I'm referring to, you know, anybody at any level from auxiliaries to catering staff to porters to you know everyone at every level. So um, that's uh, that's my monologue for this morning, I guess. I am sure that um, Sue and her guest will continue that conversation and maybe pick up on those points. But thanks for listening to me. Thanks for letting me share my story. And um, as I said, never easy, but I hope it helps somebody who's listening. And uh, I raise my raise my mug to you and wish you a very happy and healthy World Menopause Day. Thank you. I, I think I always like listening to Leah and I think she's given us a lot of food to thought. And I know some comments have already come through. Um, Dana Colburn, hi, Dana, says, 
is funny. Shouldn't we all have these on offer as workers, which reiterates what Leah's really talking about. So we'll pass quickly on to Loretta. And I know with, with time is always of the essence. This is always the quickest hour in the whole week. But I'm really delighted to be joined by Loretta Dignam. She's an award-winning marketeer of the year and a recent an entrepreneur of the year, runner-up in the Image Businesswoman Awards of 2023. So hot off the press. She's now I know she's going to talk about this wee thing, and it's in the background. She opened the doors to the Menopause Hub, Ireland's first and only dedicated menopause clinic in December 2018 and that was born out of her own experience of going through menopause she's the founder and the CEO she's a passionate advocate for menopausal women and she has been smashing that taboo and striving to make menopause mainstream so you need you'll need to go and have a look at the hub and that again there's a link to that on your resources and to look at leisure but I know you're going to enjoy listening to Loretta so welcome Loretta the Screen is now yours. Welcome. Um, well, thank you very much for that lovely introduction. And um, yes, that's that's my background. Um, it's very interesting to hear about other women's experience of menopause and perimenopause. And I use the word menopause to cover every type of menopause, perimenopause, postmenopause, early menopause, premature menopause, medically induced menopause, surgical menopause. And I can tell you that I spent 25 years or whatever in the corporate sector minding my own business and when I was 49 I had what was to be my last period um, and very soon after that I got hot flushes and so my story is similar but different um, to Leah's and that um, I got um, they were the only two things I knew about menopause no periods and hot flushes the immediate thought was well first of all I'm too young surely at 49 I'm too young this is a much older woman's condition and um, secondly, I thought, well, I don't know anything about this. None of my friends are talking about it. Nobody I know talks about it. My mother never mentioned it. So I better find out. So I con- you know, consulted Dr. Google typing way uh, only to receive very conflicting information. I was absolutely terrified of HRT. Um, this is about 10 years ago. So I was absolutely terrified of HRT. Born out, or you know, I had no information about it, but I just was terrified. I'd heard, and there was a narrative in my head, it was dangerous, and so on. I also thought that strong women power through. Um, and so I was going to power through menopause. Now, interestingly, when I went to have my babies, um, I was, you know, I nearly knocked down the staff um at the front entrance asking for the epidural. So I was never going to power through childbirth. I know some women do, but I didn't. I didn't want to. Um, but I was definitely going to par- par through menopause. I don't know why. So this is how rational or irrational we are. Um, however, the interesting thing is I never heard the word perimenopause. So all the symptoms that I experienced throughout my 40s went um, unconnected to menopause. And eventually, after three years of putting up with the symptoms, I gave in and went to seek medical help. So I'm doing little inverted commas, but because of the background, you can't see them. And went to see my uh, doctor. The GP consultation was fairly kind of all right. Um, but I decided to go somewhere else and spoke with someone for about an hour, paid a lot more because of expensive healthcare in Ireland. And I got a whole education about menopause, about estrogen, about all my symptoms, about uh, the whole um, 2002 Women's Health Initiative study about whether um, HRT was for me, hormone replacement therapy, etc. And um, I decided I was going to go on this. I had information. I was empowered. I had facts rather than fiction. And I was making a decision. So I started on estrogen. I then went on testosterone. Well, sorry, estrogen and testosterone. Sorry, estrogen and progesterone together because I still had, still have an intact womb, uh, uterus. I then started after three months testosterone, which I didn't know women even needed or could take. Um, And that was like, for me, a missing piece of the jigsaw. And... All of a sudden, my hot flushes were gone, my vava voom, my joie de vivre, all that thing, my vitality, my mojo, my, everything was back. And I was just back to my old self. So that caused me to start investigating with other women about what their situation was. And the interesting thing is, so if I go through my symptoms, 
I had about there's I don't know there's a never never ending list at this stage but on our menopause hub we have a, a, a symptom checker we call it that we give to patients and we ask them to complete it in advance of, their, of coming to us, see us we have an app in development that will track symptoms and so on but uh, there's about 40 odd symptoms uh, it could be 40 could be 50 I read 62 last week it depends on you know how how you divide them down but when I look back I had so many symptoms of menopause of perimenopause um I was going from one um specialist to another so to give you an example of some of my symptoms and you see I'm not in the throes of it anymore because my symptoms are all under control and I feel great but when I was life was difficult it was challenging the same words that Leah used it was isolating it was um it was lonely um, and it was really difficult to navigate. And this is before we've had Davina McCall coming and talking about menopause, before we have menopause policies, we have lots of conversations, all the celebrities, menopause shampoos and all the rest. So we're talking 10 years ago. So um, when I look back, so I had headaches. I was sent for a brain scan and um, everything was fine, thankfully. I also developed focal migraine. Nobody mentioned menopause. I had acid reflux and was sent for all those tests with, um, you know, cameras and scopes. I had um, pains in my ankles, which I would never associate with menopause. I had dry eye. I ended up in our local um, eye, and ear, eye and ear hospital in their a &E department three times. I first of all thought I must have something like a brain um, tumour or something because the pain was so bad. And when they said to me it's dry eye, I couldn't believe it. I then went um, for, I had urinary tract infections all the time. So um, I was on antibiotics six months at a time, then I get thrush, then on some, and then on diflucan, then back to the, um, the antibiotics. I actually developed asthma, which women can develop. So before that was diagnosed, it was chest infections, and I was on antibiotics for those. I developed sinusitis. I had bladder leakage. So when I laughed, coughed or sneezed, I had urinary and um, stress incontinence, got up to go to the loo in the night and, um, you know, uh, nocturnal incontinence. And um, I had uh, night sweats, which I just put down to, I was a bit warm. And um, I was fatigued. I described myself as a slow puncture. So these are all the symptoms, loss of libido. I wasn't, I didn't have as many of the, you know, psychological anxiety and all the rest symptoms, I'm, I'm pleased to say. But I did, my mood was very flat. And instead of walking on a flat surface like that, I always was on a bit of an incline. So it took all my resources to get through the day and just live a normal life. I'm a single parent. I read my children myself and they're over 18 now. So I call them my kiddos. I was working full time outside the home in fairly senior roles and um, running the home and, you know, earning the only income and so on. So um, I went to my doctor, in my as I said, in my 40s, and I remember saying, I'm sick all the time. Why am I always sick? And the doctor said, look, you're just having a bad run of things. Nobody mentioned perimenopause. I was incapable of joining the dots and no one else was joining them for me. So when I got to, to feel really well, I said, right, that's it. I'm going to do something to help other women. If I have a magic wand to wave, I want every woman in the world to know about menopause, to know perimenopause, what the symptoms are, what the treatment is, etc. And I want to empower them through information, through facts, not fiction, to be able to actually empower themselves to seek treatment if they need it, but to actually, you know, get themselves and manage their way through menopause. So I, I set up the first clinic without any medical background, I must say, you know, so um, I have to say that was a feat um, in itself. And sometimes little knowledge is a dangerous thing or sometimes, you know, um, ignorance is bliss. So if I knew then what I know now, I maybe not, may not have done it. But I got one of the doctors in Ireland who was um, a leader in, in menopause to help me establish the clinic. Now we've 11 doctors, we've a consultant gynecologist, we have nurses. I actually think advanced nurse practitioners and uh, prescribing nurses have a fantastic role to play in this area and there's just not enough of them in Ireland but anyway I think that's a great breakthrough for us and um, I also uh, so we have these three clinics so we have evidence-based treatment we have a psychologist a women's health physiotherapist a dietitian and nutritionist we're bringing on board um, a sleep specialist particularly someone in ICBT which is for insomnia and we're bringing along and uh, bring on board a mental health specialist so we offer evidence-based, holistic in as much as possible treatment. 
So what I was going to say then to you is, right, I also do a lot of advocacy. So I'm talking to ministers and government and to anybody who will talk to me, to media, everybody. I've done work with the international, so with the Irish National, sorry, the Irish, the INMO, the Irish National, the Irish Nurses and Midwives Organisation in Ireland. And I um, worked with them on their position paper or position statement on menopause back in 2019. They've also done research in conjunction with us um, about menopause and how that impacts women. And 82% of their members who experienced menopause said they considered giving up work due to their symptoms. So you can see that this profession, which is highly focused and dominated by women, also, you know, is also one with a lot of risks because women can walk out and the likes of Leah, talented, experienced women walking out because they can't get the support for, uh, for, for what they need and they find it difficult to work in the menopause, work as a menopausal woman. So the advocacy is a big thing. And then the third area I'm um, really busy in is the area of menopause in the workplace training. Um, I also do, um, we also have CPD accredited e-learning as well as hybrid, as well as uh, live training. And we aim it at five key audiences, all colleagues, managers and supervisors, HR um, and um, menopause champions. And I'll come on to talk about a couple of the points that Leah made there, menopause champions and then senior leaders. And it's interesting because I agree with her about the policies. The policies all contain a lot of things which sound great in principle. And I deal with all sorts of organisations. So I've worked today in Ireland, um, the, we worked with the civil service and they've introduced, um, I know I haven't yet shared my presentation, but I'm thinking about the time and wondering, will is there a point in, in sharing the presentation? Because basically what we have is that um, the, the civil service have launched a policy, which is going to, uh, it's the policy framework that would be used as a template for the rest of the public service. And my concern about some of these things is that most people in the civil service will be working in a desk-based job. So a desk-based job is, it could be at home, it could be at work. So they do, can get access to some of these things that are talked about. But I also do training with organisations, nurses, do training with um, the post office workers who go out and deliver the post, who work in big parcel businesses, who work in kind of warehouses, women on factory floors, women who uh, drive buses, who drive trains, women who are, um, today we were talking to air traffic controllers. You know, these people are in roles where they just can't get up and go and take a little break in a room um, and they can't go and, you know, take time out. Um, some women told us they had very heavy bleeding, flooding, um, a bus driver, she couldn't get off the bus to change her pads, her clothes and those kind of things. So these are the kind of circumstances that we're talking about. So what we're trying to do is, we're trying to get organisations to look at menopause through the lens of a menopausal woman in the workplace. And whatever your workplace is, I can't advise you about your workplace. You're best placed in your workplace. So we need risk assessment. We need occupational health to be involved. We need maybe chief medical officers to be involved. We need women themselves to speak up and to talk about their personal experience, because it's only through that that we will get to find out about what happens on on the ground in work. I've said, imagine this, why don't you reduce the shifts? Why do they have to be eight hours? Why can't they be, sorry, why do they have to be 12 hours? Why can't they be eight hours? What about, um, you know, changing um, rotas and changing um, shift patterns? What about some of these different things? I spoke to nurses who told me that they were on the, the medicine trolley delivering, they're spending medicines and they said because of brain fog and memory loss and those kind of things, they didn't feel confident. So they had an informal arrangement with another colleague to take over their trolley and they went and did some of their colleagues' work. That's not good enough. An informal arrangement. So this is why we need to, this is just the beginning. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Now, I'm concerned about time, 1950. So do I have time to show any charts or do we want to move on to questions? Can't hear you. I have to unmute myself. Yeah, you, you have a. We can we can run over a little bit. I think. Okay, I'll there's a few a questions one. coming through, so do. Okay, I'll just show a couple of slides um, that I think um, are might be important, um, and I'll just pull them up here, and I'll just fly through the ones that I think are of any um, any significance. So that was me, right? Obviously, cardiovascular disease is the theme this year, folks. 
women have an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. It's the number one killer of women globally in the UK and Ireland. So we need to be looking out for our heart health, which gets worse as we become postmenopausal. And therefore, we need to consider this for the future. So the spotlights on cardiovascular health. But the other two other diseases that we have is osteoporosis, osteopenia. We're at huge risk of this, women, because we lose 2% of our bone density a year and Alzheimer's and dementia because we have those estrogen receptors in our brains. So this is something from the Nursing Times and this supports exactly what Leah said and what I've also said is that, you know, they're saying that menopause is destroying some nurses' careers. This was said at the Royal College of Nursing in Brighton at their at their um, conference earlier this year, May 2023. It's not only um, menopause, it's actually menstrual health. It's, um, it's lots of other areas of women's health. They said women's health is a workplace issue and we need employers to step up now. It almost destroyed my career dealing with endometriosis and menopause. So Leah's not alone. Um, and none of you are alone. So I do think it's really, really important for people to get your voices, to get into your unions, to get into all of those people and start putting forward um, your case around this, because it's only when we keep bashing down doors, we keep um, uh, focusing on the issue. Data is so important because if you could size the problem and say X many nurses feel this or said that or want this or want that, you actually start to make it. Um, something that's actually a compelling business argument. We've gone through a bit about menopause, but I just wanted to show you, we have over on our, our symptom checker, and this is in the resources, divided into mental, emotional, psychological symptoms, the physical symptoms, and then what we call the genital urinary. They're the ones that can affect us in the pelvis, in the bladder, in, in our geni genitals, and can also impact relationships and sex life. Our survey, we did a survey this year among 3,000 women and um, menopause of women and over and 65 percent of us told us that menopause negatively impacted their sex life so it's not just confined to women it's not just confined to work it's actually confined it's, it's broader into the partnerships relationships and families so you can see all these different symptoms and you can check it out and um, if i'd had this in my 40s i would have saved myself seven maybe 10 years of suboptimal health going to this specialist and that specialist I actually would have done myself a huge favour. I would have been more productive. I would have been in better health. I would have felt better. And everybody around me would have felt better. So I just think getting the information out for women is really, really important. 80% of women will have symptoms. So you may not have them all on the mental, emotional, psychological side. You may not, you know, you may have them, you know, dot around. They may come and go and so on. And it's very easy to mix up with other symptoms. And particularly COVID has played havoc with women's hormones, as has the vaccine. And so therefore, and women get confused between COVID and long COVID or between um, underactive thyroid and so on. But actually, if you've ruled out all those other things, have a look at this. Once you're over the age of 45, it's likely to be menopause. There's lots of different help out there. Diet and lifestyle, the cornerstone. There's herbs and botanicals, although some women say they may as well be, you know, taking Smarties. Others say they swear by them. There's hormone replacement therapy. Always had a bad, has had a bad rap since that study in 2002. But I'm sure lots of you in the nursing profession know that it's actually um, safer than, than we might have been led to believe. Um, there's a role for testosterone in there. There's a role for vaginal estrogen, whether it's through pessaries or cream, and obviously estrogen and progesterone. The marina coil is something that actually is really, really helpful for some women for that heavy bleeding once you've ruled out any, any um, abnormalities. But also um, in terms of it delivers your progesterone for your HRT, your hormone replacement therapy regime, and it can be a contraceptive. So that's a very um, useful um, uh, part of your treatment um, and lots of women experience flooding really heavy periods and this can work wonders for them there's non-hormonal medical choices out there as well need to be prescribed by doctors and in the US this year and um, um, the FDA approved a new drug for um, called Vizoa which actually um, which actually acts on the brain um, and helps um, interrupt um, the pathways so that it can help with hot flushes. Now, it's not available in the UK yet or Ireland that I know of, and it's extremely expensive in the US, but it is coming. So there are lo people looking at non-hormonal treatments. CBT, cognitive behavioural therapy, um, that's proven by the British Menopause Society to help with, um, with menopause in terms of hot flushes. So it's scientifically proven. Hot flushes, um, anxiety, 
uh, panic attacks and sleep. And then the whole area of pelvic physio, I cannot stress it enough. We do not need to be leaking. You know, sensitive bladders is made up by the marketing community. We don't need to have um, uh, leakage at any age in our lives. Um, and why menopause matters is because in the UK, almost eight out of 10 menopausal women are in the workplace. That's a huge number. And Leah, um, Leah's already said 900,000 left work, according to Bupa. It's your fastest growing demographic. You cannot keep women in, in work um, in this age group. Pension age is increasing. We're having to stay in work longer. And by 2030, there'll be 1.1 billion menopausal women on the planet. So if we all unite our voices and demand change, we can't be ignored for much longer. And um, women talked about problematic symptoms in work. They talked about lack of support and discrimination in work. And they talked about loss of income and reduced work. And Leah is a fantastic, well, I won't say fantastic, but she's an example. Don't mean she's, not, she's a great example, but a sad case in the situation that woman, the woman feels that she has to go to those lengths in terms of her career and so on. Um, and when the, the UK study did, um, sorry, the UK, um, the, the House of Commons did their piece of research, what they found out was that these are the top symptoms that affect women at work. Difficulty sleeping, so they're exhausted. Problems with memory and concentration, so they start to doubt themselves and their ability to do the job. Hot flushes and night sweats are up there. Anxiety and depression. So everything Leah said is actually you know, the case for many, many women. And there's other things further down. Of course, all my symptoms are lower down. It's not awful. Anyway, there you go. Um, and the next chart if I was to show you, sorry, is that um, what did, what way did the symptoms affect women? 72% said I feel less able to concentrate. If you're in a job that requires maximum concentration, what hope do you have? And over 12 hours, that's a challenge. I feel more stressed. We're already stressed at this stage of our lives. We've got, we're the sandwich generation, elderly parents, um, kids who maybe you know teenagers children working full-time or part-time inside the home we've got a lot going on and then layering the hormones and I feel less confident in my abilities women already stuff, suffer with an, an imposter syndrome so 67% said that they feel less confident no wonder they consider giving up work and leaving and um, it impacts us in our in our performance we take more sick leave 31% was the number there on sick leave Women, 10% of women in the UK said they left their jobs because of menopause. And day in, day out, I meet women like this who say, I gave up work because of my symptoms. But most people don't really know the reason they gave up work because they weren't even aware it was menopause. And so menopause in the workplace is important. And they are all the things that we can be doing. But obviously, you need to look at it through the lens of menopause in your workplace and your type of work. So I'll hand over um, there because I don't really like running over time because then it takes away from questions. So back to you, Sue. OK. Right. Well, we both we all come on the screen except Leah. And we're, we're, we are very short of time now, but I think we could just run over a teeny weeny bit. Um, we've got quite a lot of comments and I'll start off with some of the comments. We've had Dana and then Jenny Hall. Hello, Jenny has said thank you to Leah and I'm sure she'd say thank you to Loretta too um, for raising these issues very much in a predominantly women-led service thanks for raising about the 12-hour shifts which are actually and she's pointed this out probably more like 13 and a half hours because yeah. you, you you work longer because you don't get paid for bits of it and um, everyone should be right rousing up and shouting about it um, and then another comment from Samantha uh, Malloy. Hi, Samantha, who says, I'm 51, totally sympathise with Leah. I left a permanent position on triage as we worked like dogs. I went back on HSP, which means I work when I want and which shift I want. So this is this is what we're being forced to do, yeah. um, which is, and when you think about that, that's an awful pressure at a time when you're feeling physical and, and uh, hormonal pressure to add to you and, and Amanda says also thank you I left because I couldn't put into words how or why my passion had gone I was angry and intolerant to the system had to go for my own well-being and before I said or did something that I wouldn't be proud of thank you for that and Lucy we're getting lots of comments which is is lovely we have a wonderful audience just in case you didn't notice Larissa fantastic Lucy says thank you so much I also experienced brain fog 
following COVID have stopped working long shifts and reduced my hours in acute setting and then working bank shifts in community unit. This was an emotional listen. And I'm sure for a lot of people that will be where you've taken, you know, had to take your own steps to surviving because not everybody can just give up. You have, most of us have to work for our living. Uh, Francis says, this is a good point too. Thank you, Francis. Says reasonable adjustments should also take different forms instead of being a handful of blanket patronizing so-called solutions. Thank you for that, Francis. And um, and then we have Jean. Now she's asking a question, and I know Loretta is desperate for a question. So let's have this one from Jean. Is there an optimum age time to start HRT? At age 46 and experience symptoms for one year, some come and go. Should you wait until symptoms are very severe rather than tough some of the time? Is that one for you, Loretta? I, I'll answer. Now, you know I'm not a medic, so um, I wouldn't pretend to be a medic. And even if it was, I was, I wouldn't be answering an individual's question specifically. But to say that you can start HRT, um, you know, once you feel symptoms, you're 46, so you're in perimenopause, presumably. You didn't say your periods are finished, but I assume perimenopause. Um, and therefore, it's perfectly acceptable to take hormone replacement therapy. It will help you with your bone health, your heart health, your, your cardiovascular health. Um, and so therefore, yes, is the answer. However, it's your decision and it's up to you. And women often say, you know, do I have to be on my knees? I mean, do we have to be on our knees? No, we don't have to be on our knees. Mm. <laughs> Why wait? Um, will be my thoughts. But it's up to you, obviously, to investigate it in relation to your health and, you know, what are the things you have going on? But I know for myself if I had done what I've, you know, started on HRT back in my mid 40s or whatever, I would, you know, I would have saved myself so much ill health, really, and suboptimal health. And wh why? Why? And I think that's a very good point. I mean, because another question is from Lisa, uh, who says, how long do perimenopausal symptoms usually last? And here's the good news. <laughs> good Hooray! News is, the, good, no, the good news is, is that menopause is, uh, perimenopause, postmenopause, is a bit like puberty in reverse. So, you know, the hormone estrogen is shifting, you know, surging up through the body, results in all the changes. Well, here on the other end, it's falling off a cliff um, because our ovarian function is closing down and we don't need estrogen to push out the egg into the ovaries anymore, out from the ovaries anymore, because... Um, our ovarian function is closing. So as a result, the estrogen declines and it falls off a cliff again, exactly like puberty, except in the opposite mm -hmm. direction. Um, and therefore, um, the, the average length of time peri and post menopause is seven and a half years. It can be up to 10. We've women in their 70s coming to our clinic, but then other women wow. say, hey, um, and it was all over. So, you know, seven and a half years on average. Yeah. OK, so it's going to and it's going to vary. So thank you for that. OK, we've got uh, da, 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 uh, Helene, Helena Goldman, who says, thanks, Loretta. I've quickly looked at your symptoms check and there are symptoms that until now I wouldn't have thought of perimenop peri stroke menopause issues. Thank you so much. So that's a comment, not a question. And then Juliet in Essex. Hi, Juliet, says with the current situation within midwifery, do you think there's scope for this important issue to be recognised by management and the possible further exodus of senior and experienced staff potentially? Good questions, Julia. But of course, and remember, some of the senior managers are women. We might be going through this. What I wanted to say there on that point is that mm. you know this is the time when women are coming into the most senior part of their careers. They're taking on more. They should be able to take on more responsibility. They're moving on to you know senior management. They've kind of been waiting all their lives to get into these roles and then wham we have these symptoms so it's interesting because Leah referred to um the cross-party working group that took a recommendation to the equalities commission last year in the uk and it was rejected last november and you know why it was rejected this is for menopause to be um recognized as a protected characteristic it was rejected on the grounds that it discriminated against men <laughs> go figure so what happened was there was outrage because nobody understood the ruling. So I guarantee you that group is back. They've asked for the menopause workplace champion or menopause ambassador, which has been appointed. But they are um, will be back. I guarantee that 
there's lot, lots more cases been taken at a legislative level and cases taken by menopausal women and they've won in the UK. There's been about four cases in the, sorry, three cases in the last five weeks. And women have taken cases and won on the grounds of gender discrimination, age discrimination and disability. So we don't menopause to be a disability, but it you know, was ruled as a disability in some women's cir- cir- circumstances. So I think, right, we this is a menopause revolution. We need to get together and to say this is no longer acceptable. We're the last generation to put up with this because more women than ever are are active in the workplace Um, and the nursing profession, the midwifery, all those female orientated professions, you need to advocate for yourselves because it's very different than a desk-based job where you can pop out to the loo and go to a quiet room. So I would be saying is that you need to galvanize yourselves around this as an issue. Fabulous. That's a call to action. Great. Now we've got a comment from Dr. Sarah al Katim. Hi, Sarah, who says, thank you, Loretta, for the work you've championed and spearheaded in your region. This is what we need, a move to solving the problem. Amazing work. Hope others will be inspired to go back to their trust and encourage them to engage with their employees. And remember that some, the, 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 the management aren't the enemy because some of those are women. And they will be going through this as well. So let's work together a bit on this. OK, and we've got um, now I've got a question and a comment. I'm going to finish on the comment, but I've got a question from Lex. Hi, Lex. She's 41. Uh, just started HRT patches combined. Do I need to take testosterone, testosterone too? I suspect I know the answer, but I know Loretta will too. So first of all, I'd say um, you've just started taking them and our doctors would always say, look, give it about three months Mm -hmm. and come back for a review then. Um, You may need testosterone, you may not. It depends. Um, The the scientific evidence around taking testosterone is that it's for libido and sexual satisfaction, orgasm and all that kind of thing. But it's around the sexual function, really. Um, Anecdotally, it's around um, uh, focus, concentration, energy, clarity of thinking, va va voom, that kind of thing. And it's being there's work undergoing under being undergone or under anyway undertaken by British Menopause Society, maybe clinical trials or something starting around proving that. So I think see how you go with your with your hormone replacement therapy when they feel that's optimized. If you still have other issues, particularly around libido and so on, then I will be back to discuss that. Not all GPs feel confident prescribing it you may have to go to a menopause specialist and um, but I would definitely you know watch that space and then go back my closest friend and um, since I was six she tried testosterone and she said it didn't do a thing for her so it didn't matter I cannot be without my testosterone so you know it, it benefits some and not others so see how you go fabulous because we are all, all very different so yeah. that's a perfect perfect answer thank you so much so the comment we have from Claire. Hi, Claire. She says, thank you. Food for thought. There's much to be done and smashing the taboo. That's not something to be ashamed of. We can do so much to support each other and make improvements in our environment. That's perfect way to finish, Claire. And I always say, I said to Loretta yesterday and today, this hour is so quick and I get frustrated because we, we, I'd like some more and I'd like to listen to more. And I also say this before, remember some of these topics were returned to, and I think we did menopause last year, but I think it 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 would be worth us re-looking at this in the near future. So I assure you we will. And any questions that come through, we'll pass them to Loretta if everybody would like that. So if you want an answer, you can have one from that anyway. So a, a huge thank you to Leah who was with us virtually, Um, and a huge thank you to Loretta. Thank you so much. And we're looking forward to hearing more about the Hub and people checking your symptom checker as well. Um, And I say a big thank you to Matt Flix for looking after all our our, um, our recordings. I should have said right at the beginning, everything we do is recorded, everything, even at the festivals. And that's all looked after by Matt Flix, who look after all the sort of archiving it and keeping it safe. Now, I want to say a big thank you again to Leah and Loretta, but also to Angelo, who's behind the screens and he hasn't cut us off. So thank you for that, Angelo, because he is the one that's going to sort everything in to a lovely recording that you'll be able to access after this with your colleagues. And also for the Friday morning, six o'clock in the morning podcast. I know there's a lot of people who love that as well. And also Paul, 
who's been feeding me questions. And I should have said again at the beginning that that's why I keep looking away because they come through on my other screen. Now, so I also need to just say, stay safe, safe and well, and look after yourselves again. We'll see you next week. We're going to be doing, it's going to be a bit weird for me because I'm going to be kind of a speaker next week and writing publication and rebirth of a textbook um, with some colleagues, which is going to be very exciting. Don't forget to book for the Student Midwife Experience Festival, 8th of November, the Midwifery Education Conference, 15th of November, and then the Scottish Festival in Edinburgh on the 28th of November. All lovely and free. Oh, no, I think there's a little fee on the education conference, but there are ways and means for that. And I know our, our educationists will manage to fathom that out. So we'll see you next this time here next week. And in the meantime, take care and look after yourselves and others.